So there's a reason why I went over the basic hand drill form before I actually got into the variables um, of the balancing equation method. And the reason for that is, is uh, I want you to, to see the form first. When I first explained the uh, balancing equation method earlier, uh, the way I showed it to you, it goes from function to variables to the structure, to the form. Now, the reason why it goes that way is because uh, if you want to create something that will support life, the equation goes in that direction. For example, I know I need a friction fire to live, so I know I have to balance a certain amount of variables and then create the structure, which is the form, in this case the hand drill. But you are now in the middle of the learning process. The equation actually goes two ways. And if you flip it around, the equation is used for learning, understanding, and clarifying a process or about something. So let's flip that around. So if we go form and structure first, okay? Uh, so let's say once you've seen something enough times, okay? For example, you've seen the handle now a few times. You've seen that work. Um, you begin to see patterns emerge. Now these patterns that start to emerge when you see something enough times, those are physically manifesting variables or variations. But from these variations you want to find out what the variables are. Okay, so so from here, I'm going to start explaining the variables. Now that you've seen the method, uh, you've probably seen patterns emerging, so you'll probably be able to start to see the variables. And as we get into more and more methods, they're going to start to get clearer and clearer, and you're going to understand them better. So before we jump right into the variables, I want to describe uh, my particular way of spelling fail. Now in today's culture, we have the fail and we see them on video and some of them are hysterically funny and some of them look like they really hurt but uh, my way of spelling fail uh, in the Dao of Lao teaching method in the fire dojo uh, also has kind of a different definition as well so P-H-A-Y-L-E fail uh, means an unsuccessful attempt at trying to balance uh, the life supporting variables of a method um, in training. So the point is, is um, it's okay to have a fail in training because a P H A Y L E fail is better that you have that now in training than to have an F A I L fail when the time. Uh, comes that it's really important that you do get one. So, but the, the fails here in training um, are important to have. So you can't have successes all the time, otherwise you're not going to learn anything. But uh, you have to kind of think of them as your, your Sudoku, you know, your, they're your puzzles, they're your challenges. And that's what really makes uh, this very interesting and it allows you to appreciate all the methods. So I'll tell you a particular story about one of my fails from years ago. And uh, so I, I could do the hand drill, okay. You know, uh, I was pretty good at it. You know, I'm not like, you know, a master at it at the time. But um, I could do a pretty good hand drill. In fact, I could do a pretty good short one at like uh, maybe three inches. And... Uh, so uh, I had this friend who also trained in the uh, wilderness skills for a number of years and li he lived in Germany and uh, so we were over there teaching and uh, he was going to do a hand drill demonstration with mugwort. Now I had never been successful with a hand drill with mugwort. I mean I would, my form would be perfect, uh, I'd go for a long duration uh, my axis was perfect and I would keep going and it would look like my dust would be okay but you know I just I just couldn't get uh, a mugwort handle to ever ignite like no matter what I did 
it was very frustrating. So it was a very important fail. I couldn't figure out how to balance that out. So he was going to do a hand drill demonstration and with the mugwort and I said, really? Like, I've, you sure you want to do that as a demonstration? Because I've never been successful with that. He goes, oh, that's easy. And uh, he goes, I'll show you. And he, he did one right in front of me. And I'm like, and I looked at his, uh, his uh, spindle and uh, I noticed that it was a lot lighter from the ones that I had previously used. And then he knew what my problem was right away. He pinpointed it down like exactly what it was. Uh, mugworts need to sit out in the weather a little bit longer and deteriorate a little bit longer than usual. So it uh, reduces their hardness so it goes from uh, a harder wood to a less harder wood as it degrad degradates a little bit. And there's something about the chemical nature of it where uh, if you get it early, it just doesn't want to ignite. So it takes away, I guess, maybe that chemical nature if it's present in there and uh, allows it to, to go. So uh, I did a hand drill on his set and I got a mugwort hand drill going. And, he knew how to balance out that variable, and it was a very important lesson for me. So uh, it was an important fail. So uh, look forward to your fails because they are your challenges. That you're that way, you know you're in a period of growth and learning. That means you're about to get over a plateau and uh, um, get over that hump from there. So all right, let's get into the variables. So there are no less than 22 variables in the balance equation method that we're going to go over in the Tao of Lao training of the art and science of ethical life supporting skill of wood friction firekeeping. Now these first ones that I'm going to go over uh, actually came from uh, Humphrey's Discoveries and Clarification of the Life Value Theory. And uh, they're clarified in his stories um, from his book, Values for a New Millennium, uh, a very visceral Iwo Jima story about a, a Corporal McCorkle who gave, sacrificed and gave his life on, uh, on the island. And uh, these things are called the three conditions. At least the first three are called the three conditions and uh, they're pretty well explained in uh, Dr. Humphrey's website, lifevalues.com uh, slash 10 values. So uh, you'll see a link on there when you go to the site. But within those pages is uh, the three conditions. So what he said with the three conditions is in order for someone to uh, take responsibility for the lives of others, uh, to self-sacrifice, to volunteer, to step up, to step forward, to set your life aside, to set your life down, to lay your life down for other people, uh, to answer the call to duty. Uh, these three conditions had to be in place. And since firekeeping is a position of responsibility, we're adding these uh, three to the variables. And the first one being a uh, need. And that need is, is not a want. It's a, it's a natural need where uh, lives are on the line. It's either self or others or both. And uh, there is a real threat. But uh, chances are, like I said before, in today's world, you will probably never ever have to uh, save lives with uh, getting a fire going through the friction fire methods. But um, again, in learning this whole process with uh, the Dao Lao, you know, the, the natures, the uh, core four, um, all the balancers, the balance equation method, all these things, especially the life value theory, all these things put together, they. Uh, 
create together a big metaphor for you to be able to learn and train in any life supporting skill, no matter what it is. So the first one being need uh, is a life threat. So if that is present, that's going to be one of the conditions. Uh, the second condition, or one of the three, is reason. Uh, a person still has the ability to reason. Um, they haven't lost control of their emotions. Uh, they're not in a panic. They could still critically think, and the thing is, is that they're able to problem solve the life threat and being able to figure that out. So that person still has that in place as a condition. Third one is the person has the actual skills. They have uh, enough skill level to be confident enough to go, oh, I could pull this off. I could do this. I could save everybody. So uh, your skills had to be at that kind of level to be able to pull that off. And if you ever read uh, the story of Corporal McCorporal, it's, it's, it's a good story. You won't forget it. So, but uh, with these three conditions, uh, I'm going to add a fourth. Um, and the fourth one is to, uh, the person must also have the means or the resources to be able to pull that off. So, uh, in a short uh, Mots or more of the story, um, I once heard a uh, story that uh, while driving along the highway, uh, a doctor and a nurse were apparently the first people on scene in this major accident that they ran into. So they got out of the car and they went to go see if they could help. I mean, they were lucky to be the first ones on scene, at least for the people in the accident. But when the EMTs got there and the paramedics got there and everyone else got there, they saw the doctor and the nurse still standing there. They hadn't touched anybody in the car or in the vehicles. And they were asked why they hadn't, they hadn't done anything. Obviously they had the training. Obviously there was a life threat. Obviously they still had the ability to reason and function and uh, to help and save these people. And they didn't have to stop, but you know, they were answering the call to duty. But they said that they didn't have any gloves. You know, like latex gloves, and uh, because uh, everything was kind of bloody and it was a big mess, and uh, they had to wear self-protective gear in order to help these people because there has to be a balance between self and others, and uh, because uh, when it comes to family, uh, I is actually we in that sense. So if uh, if the caregiver gets a caretaker gets sick then the whole family suffers because of that so we have these three first variables in place we have need we have the ability to reason and problem solve we have uh, the skills or the training in place to be able to fulfill the task complete the task and we should have the means or the resources and this is not just materials for being able to uh, create a fire, it should also be the tools necessary to be able to uh, manipulate the materials into uh, what they need to be in order to fulfill that function. So, all right. So next, we're going to go over uh, a larger list of the means and resources. Okay. So in our fourth variable, means and resources, um, I broke them all down into uh, the various things that you will need uh, in variables themselves. So in regards to means and resources, the first thing we're gonna cover is uh, recording and identifying. So some of the things you're gonna need, uh, index cards are always good to have, because whenever you get a success or a fail, you have you're going to have to write um, uh, whatever what it is that you used on whatever base. We went over this before: the time, the date, whether it was a success or fail, 
and you have to put on the uh, the method that you used hand drill, mouth drill, bow drill, fire saw, or whatever, and uh, whatever other notes you might want to put on there, um, like uh, such and such, uh, the weather, or the conditions you did it under, anything you want to add on there that would that seems like important that you want to. Uh, always remember. Uh, sharpies are usually the best way to mark everything uh, in permanent. So especially when you're writing on pieces of wood, you always want to write in permanent marker. Uh, your spindles, all your parts, your bases, you always want to write in permanent marker. And um, Pencils for making marks on things for like when you're going to do cuts. You can also have pens uh, like these very super fine, the ultra fine point Sharpies when uh, you want to make a permanent mark but you need it to be a little thinner than the, uh, the medium points of the Sharpies. Uh, you're definitely going to want a log book okay, to record. Uh, not only your successes and fails and what woods and what methods you, you used and what you did, uh, but to kind of keep an idea of track of where you're going. And you can make lists as to uh, woods you want to try, what methods you're going to try next. And uh, it's always good to, uh, when you're working with someone else, to kind of show where and what you've done, where you've been, and uh, people can compare notes. So what else we got? You're going to want a digital camera. So obviously we're working with a digital video camera. That's what you're seeing me on now. And uh, which also takes pictures. I take pictures on that camera right there. But we also have another camera which not only takes pictures, it, it does little shots of video as well, which is really helpful. If you're going to have a camera, you may also want to stand. Because if you're going to video yourself and you're by yourself, obviously, you're going to have to have something that holds your camera for you. Otherwise, as soon as you're done, you make out your index card with your Sharpies. You put it next to your the method that you did, and you could just take a picture of it with the call to show that you had a success or a fail, because they're all important. Uh, you may also want to have a clock, which I have hanging here over here in the corner, and a calendar that tells you the date so that you can keep track. You may just want to keep your calendar inside your notebook so that you can keep track as well, which is what I have. So, all right, so that covers, under means and resources, that covers recording and identifying. So the other thing you're gonna need is a work area. So wherever it is that you're training in, uh, it's gonna need uh, a few things. Um, you're gonna have a lot of tools. Some of them are gonna be power tools. So wherever it is you're working, you should have electricity. Okay, in my he dojo, or uh, in Japanese, the fire dojo, which is a structure um, which I built uh, just for doing fire devices on. Um, you'll see more of it later as we go into detail about all the methods that uh, were created. You'll see more bits and pieces of it as it comes to life. Um, you're going to want some kind of work table. This is an old table that I converted and I made it the work surface for my he dojo and uh, you'll notice something these cuts that are in here that I put in the table well they're actually for um, clamps they're for clamps so what I do is I fit my clamps in here and they allow me to be able to pull down some of my bases and boards like this and I have one here for the middle of the table as well now you don't have to do this but it's just something that I made for myself to be able to do so for example when I'm doing the um, fire plow this holds my base right here while I'm doing the technique so I 
you custom design it the way you want to be because it's going to be yours. Make it very personal. So what else we got? Um, you're going to need plenty of good ventilation. Now I'm in my sunroom. I got all the windows open, and because we have electricity, I have electricity rigged to the heat dojo. I also have the ability to blow the smoke away with a small fan. Uh, your workshop area should also be out of the elements. Now I'm covered. Uh, the sunroom has a ceiling, uh, so I'm always out of the rain and uh, out of the elements. No matter what the weather is, I can train and practice. Um, if you want to go and do it out in the weather, you know, that's a thing you want to do later. But first you want to get your methods down before you actually start going outside and practicing in, in bad weather. Um, I got plenty of lighting as well. So I got the ceiling lighting. I got a couple of side lights here, which I throw on there. Okay. But I have plenty of good lighting to see what I'm doing, especially at night, because what I do is a lot of, uh, I do some of my training here at night, and I need to see what I'm doing. So, um, and that's about, that's about it for your work area. So the next thing we're going to cover is uh, storage and containers. Okay, so next thing is storage and containers. I think I had said before that uh, containers are probably our most undervalued uh, tool that we have. Containers are very important because they keep things organized and together and out of the elements especially. So uh, the ones that I mainly use are um, Tupperware, not necessarily Tupperware but plastic containers like uh, I bought these uh, like the Chinese soup containers. Well I bought them in bulk online and I got a whole bunch of them along with the lids and they're great for holding tools like here I have some milkweed seeds and uh, some of my small screwdrivers but I keep all kinds of things in these containers small bits of wood that I need to use later and uh, it keeps them together and keeps them out of the elements so uh, nothing gets ruined so I especially like using these, keeping things together. You can also get uh, really creative with containers. These are actually um, Arrow containers. And I went to an archery store and they were just getting rid of these because they don't need them anymore. They were selling them for $2.50 a piece. And what I've done is I use them to hold my uh, long hand drill shafts the spindles so I got a bunch of these and I use them to hold hand drill mount drill any of the long spindles so you can get creative with your containers I'll show these more later when we do uh, hand drill and mount drill um, I like to use buckets a lot because it allows me quick and easy access to whatever it is I need this one is for all my hand tools as you can see, I got quite a bit. This kind of count constitutes my uh, toolkit. So I got clamps, pliers, cutting tools, screwdrivers, flashlights. But I don't just use them for tools, I use them for my materials as well. And sometimes you may want one of these bucket buddy things that go on the on the buckets with all the pockets so you can keep stuff in there too. And this is the one that I use from hand drill spindles. I've got mullins, evening primrose, teasels. I keep them all in here and they keep them all organized. I put them together with rubber bands. So rubber bands are another good um, container that keeps things together. But some of your things may be too large or uh, you have too much of one thing that you want to keep in one area. And... Uh, What's usually good for that is uh, totes. I like totes a whole lot because they can even be out in the weather with the, when you have the lid on and uh, there's no chance of anything getting ruined. So everything in there stays completely dry as long as it's not cracked or ruined. And in here, you can sort out all your stuff. Like this is a uh, cordage, uh, like fiber kind of tote that I have. And I keep cords in here, the jute is here, rope 
is on here. I have the Rafi in here, some rawhide. So I know that everything is in one place, one area. And I usually keep the lid on this too. Uh, and then if this is going to be your permanent home for that kind of subject, you could write on the tote what it is. Like I would write cordage, cordages or fibers on the side of the tote there. All right. And the other thing that's always very helpful is uh, large plastic bags that have the seal. You can use the zipper type or the type you press, but um, for stuff that is too large and wieldy for the plastic containers to go in, you may need something just a little larger that has a little bit more room. And here I have uh, some examples of wax sinew, also known as uh, artificial sinew, uh, wax nylon, artificial sinew. And I keep those together there. And uh, again, make it personal. So whatever other containers that you feel you may need that fits your um, training style, you just add that to it, all right? So one thing I want to add for uh, safety and peace of mind is uh, when you're also being uh, creative with your containers, uh, you have to keep in mind if there's any kind of danger or uh, uh, disappointment ahead of you. So you can be creative like using uh, gourd, you know, coconuts, if you want that natural, primitive, traditional kind of effect. Um, but you know, if you don't care, it should be very practical, like using an old coffee can with the lid. Um, but definitely stay away from glass and ceramics. Okay, you don't really want to have these around because, uh, first of all, if they break, especially during a demonstration or anything like that, uh, it creates a safety hazard. And the other thing too is, is uh, with ceramics, they break. So, uh, which is also a real major disappointment when you're in the middle of doing something or, and then you don't have a container. So stay on the safe side, stay on the practical side and keep your containers um, out of the elements and out of danger, okay? Let's keep going. So it's also very important that you keep your work area neat and clean and organized. So uh, another variable of means and resources is you're going to need cleanup stuff. So you should always have some kind of broom, uh, dustpan with a smaller broom to pick stuff up. You're going to have stuff on your work table, you're going to have stuff on the floor, you're going to have stuff everywhere. Make sure you have some kind of garbage receptacle. Here I got an old galvanized uh, pail, which I just throw uh, old shopping bags in for garbage. Dump that in there and just take out the garbage whenever I need to. But it's very important you keep your place uh, clean and neat and uh, it gets very messy because what you end up doing is start tracking stuff all over the place as well as it creates a hazard. Um, you don't want a fire hazard so you got to get rid of all that uh, extra coal extender lying everywhere, all those shavings ends up being like tinder. So it makes it a safe area, not just a clean area. A uh, nice organized area to work. All right, so just keep that in mind as well. Also under the aspect of uh, cleaning up and keeping things neat and organized, you may want a separate container of stuff that is um, burnable. So any of the pieces of wood, old sawdust, um, shavings, all that stuff you're going to want to throw into something separate than other than garbage if you're going to be burning. Um, if you want to do it the green way, if you have a, a wood stove or you have a campfire nearby, like in your backyard, you have one of those braziers set up and uh, you could just dispose of the pieces the natural way by burning it all instead of just throwing it in the garbage. It's up to you, but just to keep that in mind as well. Okay. So another very important aspect is just safety whenever you're doing your training. Um, whenever you're doing any kind of cutting or anything that could possibly get thrown up into your eyes, you're always going to have a pair of safety glasses or safety goggles. I can't wear goggles, they fog up too much, so I always have a 
safety glasses. And uh, again, it comes in all shapes, sizes, colors. Make it as personal as you want. Um, all kinds of pricing. Uh, you're going to want uh, a good pair of gloves, work gloves, just to keep your hands safe. Again, remember when you're working with gloves, uh, when you're around power tools, especially like a table saw or a circular saw, it doesn't get caught in there, and then your whole hand goes in there. I've seen that happen a lot of times in the emergency room. Guys come in and they're the do-it-yourselfers on the weekends, and they come in because they cut themselves on the, on the saws. Uh, so... Uh, don't let your gloves cause injury as well as helping you avoid injury. Another thing is ventilation as a safety aspect. Have a fan nearby uh, just to get the smoke out of your face or out of the whole area. Okay? Your area, again, should also have good ventilation to begin with, especially if you're outside. Uh, again, and you should also have the ability to put out a fire just in case. Chances are very low that a fire can get away from you. Uh, in a controlled area, but you should always have those safety aspects in place. I always have an extinguisher near me, and whenever I'm outside, I have access to a lot of water. And uh, as you saw before, I have a shovel with some earth nearby, which just completely buries the fire and uh, gets it under control right away. So um, another thing, uh, safety aspects as well, is if you have any kind of blades or sharp objects around, that they're always put away in their proper place and they're not lying around. Always put your tools away where you can find them next time. And they're available and uh, especially if you're like me and you have kids running around, uh, you can't let them have free access to those things. So make sure your work area is a safe area. Okay, next thing. Another important part of your means and resources is measuring devices. Um, to help you keep track of uh, what it is that you're doing um, when you're logging all that stuff down. So I have all manner of uh, clear rollers because sometimes I need to see actually behind the measuring device to see what I'm doing. This kind of looks like overkill but I just happen to have a whole lot of them. Uh, protractor as well as some uh, squared edges that help with measurements. And again, they're clear so I could see behind them. Sometimes you need to do that. Uh, when I need to draw a good straight line, I have some uh, wooden rulers as well as a yardstick so that when I'm using my Sharpie to be able to put down a line, I have a nice straight line for that and when I don't need to see behind the wood, but I just do need a good line. So I have those. And I also have a uh, uh, lever for not only for measuring, but to see if I need uh, to keep something straight okay, for my larger pieces. And sometimes when I go to the um, hardware store, I need to measure big planks of wood or I need 2x4s uh, or things like that. So I always have a good tape measure on me for stuff or if I just need to do stuff real quick. Um, I happen to have this old uh, folding ruler, which has helped me quite a bit in the past. Sometimes I'll take this to the hardware store instead of a tape measure, and I'll just fold this out real quick, get what I need as a measurement, and then just throw it back in my pocket. And obviously I didn't take it from the hardware store, because they don't sell stuff like that anymore. Uh, you may need some rulers that have uh, more than inches or centimeters as a measuring device. Um, again, we're in the United States and we usually go by the English and not by the metric. But it's good, it's important actually to have both. Uh, to understand centimeter rules, things like that, meters. Uh, this one particular ruler has uh, six different types of measurements, not just inches and centimeters and again for measuring we went over this before but you're going to need a diameter gauge especially for when you're keeping track of all your spindles and what sizes they need to be because again you're going to need to know so that you're not wasting your time with the wrong kind of surface area um, especially when you're going to be using your hands 
you don't want to be using a diameter that's not only going to ruin your hands, but is so small or so big that you've, uh, you've severely decreased your chances of being able to get a fire in the first place. So it's important that measurements, uh, it's, what's important about measurements is that they keep you within your mean, your standard of knowing what it is that you can or can't pull off so you're not going too small or too large. And I might have mentioned earlier before that uh, if you are going to have um, gauges, make sure they're not the type that you use for drawing. For example, this one, these ones are actually bigger than the diameter that it says because what it does is it allows for the pen or pencil that's inside to create that diameter. So if you're going to put something through here, that is actually the wrong diameter of that size because what it does is it allows for the pencil or pen inside of it. You have to have a standard gauge that has the actual diameter. So be careful if, when you buy these, especially at the arts and crafts store. That's a different function than that of trying to measure stuff at like the hardware store. So this is for drawing and this is for actual measurements of actual diameter. Uh, okay. And that's measurements. On to the next thing. So another important variable of means and resources is securing things. Um, being able to hold stuff down while you're working on them. So we have all kinds of clamps. Here we have a spring clamp that holds things in place, but the problem is that can still move. So we have the standard screw clamps. We have a bunch of those. But what I really, really like to use and I use often are the quick grip clamps. So whenever I want to, usually, usually when I'm doing a demonstration, I just put this down put it together, squeeze it tight, and then it doesn't move, and then I'm ready to do my demonstration or whatever it is that I'm going to do. So I, I use the quick clamps quite a bit, and they come in all kinds of different sizes. We even have small mini ones. So You're going to need to secure things in all ways and manners. So we have uh, cable ties. Here I have a whole bunch of colors and sizes in case I need to organize them like that. Uh, you're going to need all kinds of ropes. You're going to need all kinds of cordages or fibers. You can go the primitive way, but that takes a long time. But that's part of the training too, if you like. You could use rawhide. Uh, again, we have the, art of the uh, wax nylon or artificial sinew. And there's times when you you need uh, where it needs to stretch to hold things down. So we have all kinds of bungees to fulfill that function. And uh, whatever else is that you need. Um, I have a vise, you know, a standard uh, tabletop vise, workshop vise that I have in my uh, workshop area. So I have that. And uh, another good thing for securing though is to have a good work table and workstation. And uh, again, with personalizing your workstation, you're probably going to want a chair too. Now, my chair is also a uh, step stool in case I need to reach stuff. Because I'm a little short. But I put a pillow on it and I use that as my chair as well, which is really convenient. So, devices that you need to secure, whatever it is that you're doing or working on, is also very important. So uh, one thing that I did, forgot to mention for securing is uh, you may want to uh, work with some glues. Um, there's all kinds of glues out there. I pretty much 95% of the time use epoxy. So I get epoxy in bulk and I mix it myself and I put together whatever it is that I need to do. There are some glues like Gorilla Glue. This foams, by the way. It's like that expanding foam. So you have to be careful that you know what it is that you're doing, what the function of the, the glue is before you actually start using it. So uh, this is an important tool to have in your toolkit too for securing things 
is uh, you're going to be gluing stuff together too as well. All right, so keep that in mind as well. So now we get into the real nitty gritty of uh, tools that you'll actually be using uh, for manipulating the materials into uh, what they need to be in order for them to work. Um, when we went over the stone tools, we went over those six functions that you go through. The straight edge, the perpendicular edge, drilling, piercing, abrading, and pounding and hammering. So we went over those six functions, but you're mainly going to use only uh, a few of them. Now the main one, one of the main ones is the straight edge. And the straight edge comes in many, many kinds of variations. Now you're going to have your standard straight edge, which is a knife. And I have a whole bunch of knives here that are used for carving. A uh, small one for more details, larger knives for hacking and taking off big chunks. Um, so your knives for whittling, carving, major carving. Uh, good strong knives too, uh, not flimsy ones, unless you're doing really, really fine carving. Okay, then the knives can be somewhat thin. I even have a set of uh, just carving knives that comes in all kinds of tips and shapes and sizes. Uh, but what I usually use is, if I'm just going to use, uh, if I'm just going to do a little bit of whittling, is I just use my lockback, my uh, Spyderco, which is one of my favorites. But again, we're talking about the straight edge. So again, they come in many variations. Here I have this, um, this is actually a box cutter uh, blade, but what it is, it's turned into a scissor. So when I'm like out in the field and I'm collecting uh, like hand drill spindles or something like that, I just take this because it's really sharp and very thin and I'll just cut myself a spindle just like that with one of these. Uh, Sometimes you need something really thin, so what I have is a box cutter with the box cutter blade. But again, you have to be really careful that these things don't shatter on you. And you cut yourself. I have a, a pair of pruners for the same effect, for stuff that's a little harder. But again, we're talking about the straight edge, so we can also be talking about sawing. Here I have a folding saw. And uh, your hacksaw. And you can have the whole hacksaw with the... Uh, handle and stuff like that, but the blade is, is what's really important. Um, you have your standard uh, fine tooth saw for uh, cutting boards and just pieces of wood. I have an old one and a new one. Now for larger stuff like branches on trees, if you're collecting um, stuff in a traditional manner, you may want a camp saw. And uh, if you need to get into hard to reach places, Again, we're talking about the, the straight edge. You may want a chainsaw. And we're going to get into more power tools. For example, one of my favorite ways to cut is, uh, especially when it comes to hollow things, hollow spindles, and we're talking about scoring earlier, is the use of a Dremel. Because what the Dremel will do is, once you secure this down, put my glasses on is what this does is this just cuts. cuts as a straight edge as it goes along. And what it is, it's a very, very fast abrading cutting tool. And abrading, again, works better sometimes on wood than does a blade, which increases your chances of cutting yourself. Um, for some larger pieces, I have a larger cutting tool, and uh, some of the tools that I work with, I have to actually cut through metal. So this metal cutting wheel, as well as a uh, wood cutting wheel, works very quick and efficiently. And again, you should always practice safety with any kind of power tools. So uh, now I'm going to show you some other straight edge cutting tools that are power tools, but I'm going to take the camera and, and go over that with you. Okay. So here we have a jigsaw. My blade that's on here is uh, 3 eighths of an inch. I used to have a one quarter blade on there, but it busted. So I have a, a stronger one, a new one. This is brand new. 
and this works really really well for getting a quick notch so I flip this on and when I want to get myself a notch I just go zip 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 this way with that and that works really quick and efficiently um, when I don't want to waste time and it's just me and I don't feel like using a knife or a standard saw Another thing I'll use for cutting, which is a straight edge, is the, the jigsaw. And uh, what I'll do is I'll clamp this on my table. And uh, I'll just use the jigsaw to just run myself a quick uh, notch edge in there when I need to do that. So I'll use that as well. I have a reciprocating saw, which I use for a lot of branch work. So if I'm around a tree and I want to cut off a branch for it because I need a uh, board, a uh, base, or something like that, or I'm cutting a spindle, and uh, since this one works on a battery, I just take this one out with me in the field and I just cut real quick. So two other kinds of saws that I have are a, you know, your standard circular saw. And I also have a miter saw, which allows me to, uh, especially when I'm working with boards, I just go... You know, zip zip, just cut that right down. And I can cut it any angle I want, which is very quick and efficient. Then you have your standard table saw, table circular saw, for when I'm ripping um, pieces of board and wood, which works very quick and efficient as well. And it comes with the brace so I can measure how and where I want to cut at any time. And again, it raises the or lowers the height of the blade as it needs to be. Okay. So all these and more perform a straight edge cut, whether it's a natural blade cutting through or it's done by very fine abrading with files or saws or by Okay, next thing is uh, the perpendicular cut. So here we have some examples of the perpendicular edge that goes uh, perpendicular to the piece of wood that you're going to uh, cut into. So if you're using stone tools, uh, before I showed you flakes and blades, well you would place those blades or those flakes on a side and you would cut along this way and have that kind of effect where it's not the straight edge but perpendicular to the material that you're cutting with and if you only have a knife and not a draw knife you can either pop a piece of wood on the end here for a handle again you have to be very careful make sure you're wearing gloves to cut toward yourself or just make sure your hand is never in front of the blade just like this when you're cutting that away. Now you're, then you have your draw knives. Here I have two different sizes, a small, a medium, and a large. Each side has one beveled edge. So you kind of have to know which way you're going to gouge into the wood. If the bevel is up, you're going to gouge more into the wood. And if you have the bevel down, you're going to be able to take shorter pieces off without um, cutting into the grain or wherever it is it's going to run. So you kind of have to have an uh, idea of how to use a proper draw knife as well. Now to keep an even shave, you could use what's called a spoke shave, where it's completely measured where the blade is and how much it's going to take off for pulling off there. Uh, what's also a perpendicular edge is a uh, cabinet scraper, which is kind of like a rectangular piece of metal with a burr on the end, very fine burr. And what that does is it allows you to be able to shave and scrape off fine pieces. So you can find that in uh, specialty hardware stores. You may be able to even find it in your hardware store, a cabinet scraper it's called. Um, another thing that is technically a perpendicular blade are things like the sure form or the, uh, the micro blades here. So here we have a few different examples. One is the, the long straight one, 
which is kind of like a cheese grater. It's like a cheese grater for wood. But technically, it's a, these are all perpendicular edges. Here's a round one for like when you're working through a hole and you're trying to open up a hole or something like that or something that's on a curve. That is also a perpendicular edge. And here we have what's called a quarter round, which is for uh, smoothing down certain spots. So those are very convenient. And uh, your axes, your hatchets, or your, if you like, if you're feeling primitive or traditional, your tomahawk, which goes, again, perpendicular to the edge that you're trying to remove stuff with. So those are examples of the, the perpendicular edge. Um, draw knifing, axing, adzing, spoke shaves, the sure forms, scraping, all those things that go against on a perpendicular angle of your material. So the next thing is drilling. So drilling can be as easy as a process as you want it to be. So depending on what it is that you're trying to accomplish, you can just have your standard bunch of drill bits, small, medium, large, and your, your drill, battery powered or electric. You can, for precise drilling, have your uh, drill press. And again, that can be as easy or as complex as you want it or need it to be. Now your Dremel will also be very convenient for this. If you have the Dremel tool kits, uh, which contains uh, abrading pieces, as well as drilling pieces, as well as cutting pieces, and uh, finishing pieces, uh, a Dremel is an all around exceptional tool to have uh, in friction fire making. It's very makes things very convenient for you. Uh, you'll want all manner of kinds of bits depending on what it is you're trying to do. Um, you can have long bits, you can have uh, bits that cut holes, clean through the wood depending on what it is that you're trying to do. Um, you can have uh, the flat circular bits that cut um, straight down and make a flat bottom. Uh, so there's all kinds of things out there. but. Um, it can be as easy or as hard as you want it to be. Now drilling could also be um, either taking a flake or blade of stone or just your knife and just taking the piece of wood and just going in on a circular motion. And again, be careful that you're not gonna cut yourself. So don't let your hand slip down the blade and cut yourself or have a folding knife that's not locked, unlock on you and then cut yourself on your blade uh, again, when you're drilling, make sure that you're not cutting toward yourself, either on your leg or even in the air, okay, because stuff can, accidents happen. So make sure you have a good work area and whatever it is that you're doing, it's safe and uh, that way stuff still stays fun and you can appreciate what it is that you're doing, okay? So next thing is uh, abrading and sanding. So here we have abrading and sanding, and we're getting a surface down through uh, taking off a little bit here and there. Now, again, primitively or tra traditionally, you could use rocks. Uh, the grainy types are best for that kind of purpose. But uh, in today's day and age, uh, just to kind of move things along and make things easier, uh, you have your sandpapers. You'll want a block, what's called a sanding block, to hold your paper. On. And again, they come in all kinds of grits, coarse, medium, and fine, all different kinds of uh, braids. Also for abrading, you're going to want all kinds of files, rasps, round files, um, squared edge files, all those for abrading. You can, again, and you can get as fine as you want. You can get even specialty uh, small type files that do all manner of edges. Or whatever it is kind of work that you need done and again the Dremel uh, which I really like it allows for a lot of control and it saves a lot of time 
like I'm an ER nurse and I always think uh, I need to save time because I don't have much time to begin with. But these Dremel bits, um, they come with uh, all manner of tops. So you can have grinding stone tops for abrading. They have sanding tops. They have wheels. They even have buffers for how fine you want to get stuff. Not that you probably go that far because um, I don't use the buffing wheels, but the abrading, any of the abrading tools I use all the time. And they're very convenient. So when you want to take stuff down, smooth stuff down, uh, like knocks on your spindles or you have uh, branches that stuck out on your spindle, you want to take that down. Or you need to fine up your board or you need to get your notch just right. So you get a fine file and you just kind of get in there and make it exactly the shape that you need it to be. Uh, so you're not messing around with anything. So abrading is gonna be, and sanding is gonna be an important function in your toolkit. And uh, to have those tools is very important. All right, so last one is hammering and pounding. Another important tool that I have for abrading is my, my belt sander. So uh, here I happen to have a coarse grit belt on my sander here. And it also comes with a five inch disc sander, which I don't have uh, uh, sandpaper on there right now. But this cuts my work down so quickly when I'm working on something. If I need to make a quick point, or I just want to round off an edge, or if I just want to smooth something down, I just flip on the switch, hold it there for a couple seconds, and I've done my work that would have taken me a whole bunch of minutes and a whole lot of energy that I can use expending toward uh, other things. So this is one of my more important abrading tools right there. So with uh, pounding, hammering, and bashing, you may need these to just uh, break up fibers or break up some pieces of wood, uh, depending on what it is that you're trying to do. Now you're gonna have your standard hammer for all kinds of things, but if you wanna go the primitive or traditional route, you're gonna have your rocks. Um, so you can break up fibers like that. Um, a lot of times you don't want to cut your fibers, so if you have fibers that you're going to break up, what you'll end up doing is pinching them between rocks and then your fibers are no good. Especially for things like sinews or fine plant material, you don't want to do that. What you want to do instead is you're going to have wooden mallets or some kind of hardwood, a you know, hardwood branch or something like that. Take the bark off first. And uh, here I have a piece of oak and here I have a piece of walnut. And uh, you could break material up with a piece of hardwood on a piece of rock. That usually works best. So if you're going to go that route. Uh, so again, with those six functions, piercing is usually not an option uh, in friction fire making uh, or other methods. So we're not going to mess with that. And uh, again, with your means and resources, you're going to have all. You're going to need all other manner of tools. You're going to need screwdrivers, flatheads, Phillips, you're going to need pliers, things like that. But you'll, uh, you'll realize that as you need them, you need to add them to your toolbox if you don't have them already. Okay. So uh, chisels, things like that, which is a perpendicular edge, you're going to need that as well to add to your toolkit. Um, that's where pounding also comes in. You're going to have your chisels. You may want to take wood off that way. So, as many ways as you can be creative, there's many ways to do uh, the friction fire methods and get them where they need to be, okay? Uh, another one that I didn't cover, which is technically a perpendicular edge, is the lathe as a power tool. And what a lathe does is uh, a piece of wood is held between two points on a lathe and it spins continuously in one direction and you have your cutting tool and it cuts stuff down into a cylinder. Um, some classic things are baseball bats, chair legs, things of that nature. But uh, what I like to use a lathe for is when I'm creating a large spindle for like a bow drill, sometimes a mouth drill, and, uh, or even a crutch drill. And uh, you put a uh, reload receptacle in it, which we're going to go over in a little while when we get into uh, part two of the hand drill, advanced hand drill. Okay, 
So a lathe is also an important, um, some, uh, depending on how advanced you want to be, a uh, power tool to have. I like to have one around for that function. Since I'm usually working with a cylindrical object as a spindle, um, sometimes it's nice to make your own. And I make my own spindles too in different kinds of woods and uh, different kinds of shapes. So we'll see that in a little while later too. All right. So one of my favorite ways to teach is to actually what's called teach in context. And that's uh, something I learned in uh, martial arts training. And it's where, um, for example, uh, you are uh, with someone that you're teaching and uh, just by either coincidence or uh, it could be also something you create. But what happens is, is a lesson kind of just presents itself. So uh, one of these instances is that, well, um, I'm going out to go collect some, uh, a willow branch that's in my backyard. And so uh, since I need to do that, I'm also just show you what and how I do it. So here we go. But what it is is uh, uh, an example from our martial arts training is that uh, one day a long time ago, um, my teacher, my sensei, was with his sensei in Japan, and uh, he was with him walking his dogs. And uh, he does this for like uh, an hour or two, uh, just about every night. It's kind of a ritual, and uh, took my teacher along. And as they're walking, he started to just kind of explain things about, you know, he notices this, and he talks about uh, how that would... Uh, uh, come into our training. He talked about like how the the light of the moon, what you would do at this time of night, you know, things like that. Kind of, it's called teaching in context when a lesson just presents itself. So here I am, uh, happen to be cutting a limb of willow and uh, getting it all set and ready for uh, teaching and uh, putting everything away. So I'll let you see my process. So here it is. It's kind of a Socratic method, you know, that kind of thing.
So the next variable is health, or uh, in healthcare language, it's uh, homeostasis. And uh, needing to keep that balance and uh, basically staying safe while you're training. So um, the next variable is going to be energy. But we can't really confuse the two because health means uh, the balance between uh, structure and function within your body. And uh, energy is uh, what you need that drives you to be able to uh, perform a function. But uh, in a way, it's a little different. Because in talking about health, for example, uh, if you're going to get injured on any one of these methods, it's most likely going to be uh, the hand drill because uh, it uh, usually forms a lot of blistering on your hands. Now, blistering can open you up to infection. Skin is, your, uh, is a defense uh, that keeps organisms out. So whenever you get a blister and the blister opens, well now you have uh, an opening in that defense and you're open to infection. So you have to be very careful about that. But the other thing too is, is that if you don't get your fire, like you're trying to accomplish, you have to be able to pull that off again and the method again and again and again until you finally get it. So health is necessary because each time you do a hand drill, uh, you're opening yourself up to more blistering and damaging your hands and damaging yourself. So you don't want to do that. So your technique has to be good where you're maintaining your health and avoiding blistering uh, while you're trying to perform a method. But you know, there's many other things too. Uh, illness can keep you from doing a method. Like I have asthma, uh, which is right now pretty good under control. But you know, if I can't breathe, I can't perform the method because uh, the exertion on myself just makes things worse. Um, if you have some kind of trauma, like a, a broken bone or you've sprained a hand or a finger and uh, you can't perform one of these methods, well, that's one of the reasons why there's so many methods. So you have many to choose from in case you can't perform one for one reason or another, and one of those being health in itself. Um, another thing is you have to be careful about what materials you're using, that the materials themselves are not going to hurt you. Uh, careful going through things like poison ivy, poison oak, poison sumac, like we said before. They are toxic. They will cause nasty blistering. Um, and uh, you don't need that because it'll stay with you for about two weeks. And it's a horrible experience to go through if you've never had it before. But you don't want it to begin with. Uh, it's important to maintain not only your health, but the health of others. I have children and they're running around all over the place. They're always getting into things. So I always have to make sure that everything that I'm doing, uh, I'm not having dangerous things lie around like knives or uh, sharp objects that are around or anything that's hot that they can touch. So I have to be careful of their safety as well. Um, in maintaining health, you have to have the protective eyewear. We have the gloves like we showed before. Uh, I unplug all my tools. I make sure that they're all turned off, um, especially the power tools, the jigsaws, um, all my circular saws, the table saws, everything gets unplugged once I'm done so that there's no accidental chance of them flipping them on and getting hurt. I keep nothing around that's hot so nobody gets burned, but uh, when you're doing your tinder bundles and you're blowing them into flame, uh, when we'll go over again later, you have to make sure that your hands are not over or near where it's going to flame, always have your hands underneath and you're going to be getting rid of that pretty quick. So careful not to burn your fingertips. Um, smoke is going to be a problem. Careful not to inhale smoke. Um, have the ventilation, have the fan around you um, so you're not inhaling that. Uh, careful when you're carving, again, that you're not in front of anything. That will not only ruin your training, but you know, if you work for a living and you need your hands, well, now you've deteriorated your function. And you don't want to do that. Either. So, uh, uh, always wear shoes because sometimes you forget and you drop things, and uh, sometimes you have stuff on the floor. Try not to go barefoot when you're in your work area, especially when you're working with tools. Um, 
always have plenty of good lighting so that you can see what you're doing. And because uh, when you're working in the dark, you can have an accident and not see what you're doing. And uh, make sure that everything is clean and organized so you know where everything is. Because if you don't, th those can cause accidents too. So you have to maintain your health. And if you're in a, a wilderness situation where you're practicing there, um, be careful of the elements. Um, if you were in a primitive situation where fire, it depended that you get a fire going to uh, save life, one of the problems you might run into is uh, being hypothermic. Because if you're really cold, you don't have the body function to be able to perform the function of s spinning the stalk or something of that matter. Or if you're doing the fire plow or fire saw, uh, your muscles aren't working up to the way that they're supposed to. So you have to keep your, your muscles going so that they can perform that function. Uh, another thing could be that if you were ever in a survival situation for whatever reason would be malnutrition or if you had a metabolic disorder and your, your blood sugar drops and then you can't perform uh, whatever it is that you need to do. So maintaining your health, whatever that is, whatever it takes for you to be able to not only continue in training but to just do whatever it is you do in general is very important. So that's an important variable is to keep your health and maintain that health. And uh, as you're, the techniques and the methods, you should avoid it uh, costing you your health as much as possible. So when your hands feel like they're starting to go and the blisters are starting to form and they're starting to get really worn out, you got to stop and give your hands a chance and let them rest, okay? Next one is energy. So with energy, uh, energy is a little different from health in that, let's say I'm, I'm feeling very healthy and uh, I'm going to try to do this technique, but the thing is, is if I don't get it the first time, I have to be able to pull that off again. So I would attempt that again, and then if I don't get it a second time or a third time, I still need to be able to have the energy to do it again and again and again. Now the hand drill, again like I said before, the pieces, the way I have it, uh, have it set up, the way the drills are in order, the spindles methods are in order, is less pieces, more effort. So it's going to require more energy. So the more pieces that you have, those methods, as we go up the scale later, uh, the more pieces you have, the less energy you're going to expend, and they're going to be much, much easier to do. So the hand drill is really the hardest one, I think, of all the methods to do. Even the linear ones, which take quite a bit of energy, I still think the hand drill is going to be the one that's going to zap the most energy from you. And uh, it's definitely could be a detriment to your health out of all the methods. So the hand drill is always the, the one to always be very careful with. But um, as you're doing your method, what's happening is your muscles are building up in lactic acid as well. So their function, which with each and every attempt, the function deteriorates. So my muscles are actually, each time I have to do this, they're able to perform less and less. So um, you're going to need to make sure there's two factors that uh, you always want to increase. Your endurance, to be able to go for a long period of time, uh, a longer duration, and uh, that means uh, being able to maintain your breathing and not um, being uh, exhausted quickly. So uh, I like to run. That's one of my favorite things to do of uh, exercise. I like running. So endurance is always a key thing. And then the other thing is strength. So at least with doing the hand drill, uh, you have to be able to coordinate um, kind of like chewing gum and walking and patting your head and uh, rubbing your belly all at the same time. So you're pushing in as well as getting as much surface area as you can on your hands for rotation and getting a lot of speed and uh, trying to keep this thing straight and then you're trying to go down and try not to stay for a long time so you grab the bottom and get back up to the top work all over again and you just got to keep going and going and going until you finally get the cold and that requires energy so the key point here really is to transfer as best you can that energy to this spot to where the friction is. 
So I'm trying not to transfer energy back into my hands, which is actually, is actually a key thing because that's what causes blistering. I'm trying to, as much as I can, as close to 100% as I can, transfer this energy to this point is what I'm trying to do. So the more efficiently, this is why your form is important, the more efficiently I can transfer that energy to the bottom of that stalk is what's going to help get me my coal. So uh, I'm going to try not to get the coal for ego's sake on the first try, but the fact that as a survival value, I need to try to get it as soon as possible because with each attempt, the energy is going to be less and less for it to be there. So that's an important variable. Another important variable is the chemical makeup of some plants and trees. Um, some of the chemicals that's part of their biology uh, just isn't automatically compatible with uh, friction fire making. Uh, I told you the story earlier of the mugwort and what my friend in Germany told me about it needing to rot a little bit more out in the weather. Um, uh, <clears throat> you have to take that into consideration when you're collecting it. So uh, once it's automatically dead uh, at the beginning of winter, it's still too hard and it still has kind of a chemical makeup that uh, doesn't allow for good friction fire. It's still uh, too hard. And uh, so it makes it a, a really tough hand drill, which if it's really hard and it's a tough hand drill, that means you're opening yourself up to, uh, um, it's detrimental to your health because you're gonna get more blistering and you're going to expend much more energy on it than you really should. Um, so at least at that point, it's as a spindle is probably better for a different method. If the spindle is uh, thick enough and straight enough, it'll probably make a good um, bow drill spindle. We'll do the mouth drill in a little while too. But as a hand drill, with all that energy expenditure, you want to be careful about what it is that you're selecting to use. Uh, you don't want to do this on ego. You want to think of this as just balancing all the variables. Um, Pines and evergreens, they have a lot of sap or resin and uh, you have to be careful that uh, in the wood that's going to cause condensation uh, when you create that heat. So when you're selecting lumber, for example, at the hardware store, make sure it's not leaking pitch. Try to get the driest pine boards you can get. And when you're selecting out in the wilderness, you obviously want to make sure that anything evergreen that you're collecting is really dead, fully and weathered and dry, but not rotten, obviously, because when evergreens uh, die, they're automatically a softwood. So any softer than that, and it's not just go it's not going to be hard enough to be able to uh, get a friction fire. It'll be too rotten. Um, chemical makeup again. You have to be careful of the plants and. Uh, like the poison ivy, poison oak, poison sumac, uh, whatever's in your area. Um, it contains specifically a chemical called urushal oil. And urushal oil, you should know, uh, poison ivy, poison oak, and poison sumac do not cause an allergic reaction. When that happens to your skin, if you've ever experienced that, it's actually a uh, it technically kind of an autoimmune disorder. So what the oil does is what it actually does is it changes the protein structure of your skin so that your body no longer recognizes it as uh, your own cells. So what your body starts doing is it starts attacking that area thinking that it's all foreign proteins. Um, so it's not an allergic reaction. If you've ever noticed, if ever you use a antihistamine or uh, something like that nature when you have poison ivy, you notice it doesn't work because it's not a true allergic reaction. It has nothing to do with histamines at all, the histamine release. Um, it's, uh, it's your body attacking itself because it can't recognize itself. So what you really have to do is you have literally 10 minutes 
to scrub that off with a really serious detergent. Uh, because it's an oil, you have to use kind of a detergent that really breaks up oil and gets rid of oil. Um, and get that off your skin. Once it's been on there for like 10 minutes or so, it's already started changing the chemical nature of your own skin and it's gonna be very irritating for about two weeks. So be very careful with that. Um, and then there's, uh, you have to understand the chemical makeup of some trees, um, redwoods and pitch pines, which are born in areas, uh, they live in areas where fires occur naturally you know, as it, uh, it's part of the ecosystem when fires go through and kind of clean up the ecosystem. And, but some trees are hardy and uh, they're resistant to fire. So some of them have the chemical properties of being able to resist fire to begin with. So you have to be, you have to know what it is that you're using um, to make sure you're not using a wood that just won't start a fire for you to begin with. So uh, again, your plant and tree identification is going to be key as one of your skills along with stone tools and uh, fiber making, cordage making for your methods. Okay. Uh, you'll notice that uh, when you're using stuff that's really resiny uh, and is kind of sappy that uh, your coal dust is going to be uh, different. It's going to be, uh, if not um, light brown, it's going to be black and striated and come off in a bunch of chunks. Um, it's going to be a different consistency than that fine dark brown black powder that you're looking for. So uh, you'll notice as you go along. The only way to learn this is, is by doing it and uh, having real training. All right, on to the next. So the next variable is uh, moisture and humidity. Uh, there's a saying out west with the people that do uh, primitive technology and uh, when they train in stone tools and basketry and pottery and fire making and things like that. When they're doing their fire devices, they say there's there's fire in the air, especially out west. It's, it's so dry out there that it's actually so much easier to do a hand drill than it is out here on the east coast where it's constantly humid. And um, we uh, used to teach classes over in Southern California in like the Santa Cruz area and uh, near the San Francisco area and uh, the ground out there is just like a giant tinder bundle I mean everything is just brown in the summer especially everything is uh, just I mean if you looked at it hard enough it would just catch fire and uh, so it would be no problem actually to pick materials off the ground out there uh, especially if you're gathering fuels for your fire and uh, other kinds of materials but out here on the East Coast, if anything is close to the ground, it's zap sapping up moisture. And it rains out here like anything, pretty much all the time of the year. So uh, if you uh, go out collecting material out in nature, which we're going to go over in a little while, um, you have to remember that, at least on the East Coast, anything that's close to the base that you cut is going to have more moisture, which is actually where you actually do the technique compared to what's up higher. Up higher, it's always gonna be drier than what's down lower at the base. So when you cut this, you might not be able to just, you know, in nature, just get a fire going because this has more moisture. So uh, one of the things you do need to think about is that if there is extra moisture, uh, and I'm talking like not green, but it's still dead, but it has moisture in it, you can actually just dry it out. Now, if you're not in a hurry to get a fire and you already have a fire or something like that, or um, you're not in a survival situation, you could uh, kiln dry them in your oven or in your toaster or something like that for a little while and dry them out. Or you can lay them out in the sun if it's not raining, if the weather is more to your favor, off the ground. Or the other thing you could do is, is pick a method that doesn't require a lot of energy. Um, I've seen people do this, for example, with uh, the bow drill. They have their spindles, and what they do is they're a little bit wet, and what they do is they just go longer with their method, um, which pulls the moisture out of the wood, dries out the wood with the heat, and then it ignites. So um, we've even done experiments where we take our 
hand drill or um, bow drill, and we actually dunk them in a pail of water. I don't mean like soak them, but I mean like dunk them. Practicing like if uh, we were in like a rain type situation. And then what we would do is we would just go longer with our method and dry them out and get a fire going that way and just practice that way, which is uh, kind of ups the ante a little bit, gives you a little bit more training. It's fun too, but you begin to realize um, what it is that you kind of need to fix with your your form and your your abilities and your methods. So, because uh, what will happen is, is the moisture and the humidity, what it does is it keeps the temperature low because we're trying to get this to a critical temperature in order for the dust to be able to ignite. While moisture in the wood is always going to keep it from achieving that critical temperature. It's always going to kind of just kind of put out your uh, attempts from being able to do that. So uh, the least amount of moisture in your apparatus, in your method, is always going to be to your benefit because it's always just going to work against you. And uh, in the air, uh, if it's precipitating or anything like that, it's going to make it harder too. So usually one of the other methods, other than a hand drill, is going to be more successful in uh, damp, humid, rainy, precipitating weather. Okay, you have to think about um, how much energy you're going to be able to use if your health uh, is going to be uh, at risk for, do, for doing this kind of method. Those kind of things you have to kind of all think out. And uh, obviously you would never cut or use anything green and try to get a fire out of that because it has just way too much moisture. And you would ex be expending an extraordinarily amount of time trying to uh, think that you're even going to get that dried out before it will even start to work. Um, so that's usually uh, almost never. I can almost say if there's a never, it's, that's not a way to go ever is to use anything green. So uh, unless you're practicing your method and you're not caring about actually getting a coal, but just working on your form, if you want to use something green then, that's fine. But uh, when it comes down to the wire and you actually need a fire, you're never going to use anything green. Okay, just so you know. All right. So the next variable we're going to talk about is wood density or the hardness of the wood itself. So um, again, this is where plant and tree and bamboo, which is a grass, identification is very important because knowing what it is that you're collecting, um, they all have different hardnesses. For example, uh, cattail. Uh, the cattail stalk spindle is very light and uh, is one of the easier ones to get going. Uh, along with yucca. Yucca is also an especially good one, especially out west. Uh, they make excellent hand drills. And what really makes them excellent is their, their, their density and their hardness is on the low scale, which means that you can use less energy to apply pressure to get this to a critical ignition temperature, okay? So the harder the wood, the harder the wood, okay, um, the more energy and the more pressure you're going to need to expend to create more friction to reach critical temperature. So knowing your density and hardness of the woods is very important. Um, one of the ways you can test it is what's called the thumbnail test. It's not always that reliable, but if you can make a dent in it with your thumbnail, um, and if it doesn't just crush or disintegrate, which means that it won't reach critical temperature to begin with because it'll just destroy itself. Anyway, um, it has to be hard enough to be able to hold together. It can't be that rotten. It has to be able to hold together to be able to um, deal with all the pressure and the speed uh, to be able to reach critical ignition temperature, okay? Um, but it can't be so hard that you can't do it. So you kind of have to have an idea of your um, materials. Um, like I said, cattails and yuccas are on the lower side, the softer side, 
require less energy. Um, you definitely would stay away from things like oaks, walnuts, hickories. You would never use those for hand drill material. I mean, it would be impossible for you to do hand drill that way. Um, you couldn't reach a critical temperature with something that hard. Um, so you want to kind of stick with things that are uh, on the medium hard side. Um, when we go over advanced hand drill, I'm going to go over what all of these are, these plant stalks. But um, when you're doing all the methods, for example, bow drills and uh, pump drills, you're going to want the medium woods, like the cedars. You're going to want Atlantic white cedar or western red cedar, uh, willows, cottonwoods, aspens, poplars, um, sycamore is good, um, ailanthus which is very common, and uh, sumacs are good, not poison sumac, but you know the, the regular sumacs. Um, another thing you have to be careful of, like I said before, is knots. Like uh, in talking about our base, some woods have, uh, when you're looking at the pine boards, for example, they have knots in them. And that's a different hardness than the rest of the board because a knot is like a, a place of where a branch is coming out of the side of the wood. It's a different hardness. So make sure that wherever it is that you're doing your drilling or you're doing your sawing method or your plow method or whatever, that you're staying away from knots. Okay, because it, what it's going to do is throw off your method. Find an area that's clear of knots, which is a different hardness. Um, uh, the other thing too is uh, remember again that weathering is going to have an effect on the hardness of the material. Uh, I mentioned the mugwort earlier that it needs to be a little bit more weathered for it to disintegrate more for it to be able to be used as a uh, good handle material. Well, um, the same thing could be said of sassafras. If you just get uh, an early dead sassafras, it's still really hard. Um, it kind of is on the harder side of the medium hardwoods and you'll expend a whole lot of energy and you may not even get a coal. But if it sits out in the weather long enough, it's going to be on the softer end of the medium hardwood after a while. You have to get it before it's truly rotten and can't reach critical temperature where it just disintegrates. You have to get it just right where um, it's been out there long enough where it's soft enough for you to spend less energy to be able to get it to reach critical temperature. So uh, your identifications are really key to knowing uh, plants, trees, and bamboo and materials so you understand their density and hardness. That variable is very important, okay? All right, on to the next. So also under the heading of hardnesses and density as a variable, um, there's two main scientific ways to measure hardness and density in wood. One is the Janka, J-A-N-K-A, -A, hardness test, and the other is a specific gravity, where it's measured in water. Now the Janka test um, measures how much force it takes to fire a steel ball that's 11.28 millimeters in diameter which is uh, a little under half an inch or just over one centimeter. So a steel ball that size and the force it's, that's required to plant that ball halfway, meaning that it goes down to the diameter of the ball. If you were to take the sphere and cut it in half, okay, how much you could sink that ball halfway into the wood, not halfway into the wood, but that the ball sinks halfway into the wood. Okay, so uh, the Janka test and the specific gravity test. Um, specific gravity is kind of where you kind of see how things kind of float in water um, in an overly simplified kind of explanation. It's a, a little more than that. And both of them have their variations because no two woods are the same. Even the same wood from the same species, they're not all going to be exactly the same. And the tests are always going to be a little off. 
But what they do, though, however, is kind of confirm uh, when you've already been working with woods, what you've kind of already guessed or kind of already had an idea. So, for example, these tests tell us that um, balsa wood uh, has less hardness than pine, and pine has less hardness than basswood, and what do we got? Chestnut has less hard is uh, basswood is less hard than chestnut chestnut is less hard than Douglas fir and Douglas fir is less hard than cherry which is not here and uh, and sycamore uh, cherry and sycamore are less hard than walnut and walnut is less hard than ebony, and ebony is less hard than lignum vitae. Uh, and there's many woods that go by the name lignum vitae, which means the wood of life. However, uh, it's what I'm specifically talking about is the official species. So not one that uh, some people try to pass off, but the real lignum vitae. For example, on the Jonka test, lignum vitae rates as probably one of the highest, or the highest, at uh, 4,500 on the test. So, and the truth is, I don't really, um, I, I don't obviously don't perform these tests. So I don't try to do specific gravity. I don't have a, a machine that does the John Crow Hardness test. Um, when you look these things up on the internet, they're basically kind of a reference. And they're basically kind of confirming, like I said, what you kind of already know, is that one is harder than the other, and that there is kind of a scale. So uh, you might just kind of want to take a look at that uh, on the internet and uh, kind of get an idea of where things kind of just fall into place when it comes to hardness and density of certain kinds of woods. You may just kind of want to know, especially the ones that are located in your area. For example, I wanted to know things like sycamore and cedars and uh, sumacs, things like that that are around here. Or the walnut, the chestnut, they're all from around here. So I kind of wanted to know what those harnesses kind of fell on the scale. So you may want to too. But there's those scientific references if you really need to know. But uh, they're not completely necessary, just so you know. But they're, they're good to know. So just keep that in mind. Now your next important variable is fuel. Now the fuel that I'm talking about here is the actual coal dust that is created from you doing your method. So in this case the hand drill. So your fuel or the coal dust as it collects in the notch has to be the right consistency, has to kind of look the right color has to be uh, the right um, texture. It can't be striated or come off in chunks. It has to be kind of powdery. So the more you do this um, process, the more you see uh, what to do and what not to do, the more you do it in training. But the coal dust, if you were to think of it in terms of biology, like we were doing before, the more dust you make, the more fuel you make, it's kind of like a placenta. Now, once you take a coal and it's ignited, okay, we will call that like a fertilized egg where it's ready to grow, but its life is only gonna be, if you leave it alone, as long as there is fuel. So, the more fuel you have in this notch, uh, the more food and sustenance it has to stay alive. So that's why coal extender is always very important. And no matter what dust you have, um, whether it's from success or failure, always save it. Okay, always have a separate container on the side, have a little brush, and uh, always put that away and set it aside for later. 
because uh, uh, it's going to add to the life of that coal. So again, thinking in terms of biology, um, the spindle is the male aspect, the base is the female aspect, and when this goes correctly, uh, it achieves a fertilized egg, which is the coal ember. Uh, the more fuel that you have in there, the more dust you have, the longer that fertilized egg is going to stay alive, uh, the more sustainable it's going to be. So that's kind of like a placenta. And then what will happen is that fertilized egg, that coal ember, gets transferred to a tinder bundle. Sometimes the tinder bundle is directly under the base ready to go. But you would consider the tinder bundle kind of like a uh, uterus in biology. So because uh, that's where the flame is going to be born from because the more you blow on the cold ember inside the tinder bundle it's starting to be born and it's actually giving birth and the more you go the more you go until finally the tinder bundle bursts into flame and in a way that's considered birth so but then you have your uh, TP structure all ready to go the ignited tinder bundle goes inside and now it's on its way to being uh, a child, teenager, and an adult until finally the fire is out and it's can finished its life cycle. So uh, again, creating fire is very much like creating a life. Uh, it's a very exciting thing to do. Um, so with that, uh, your dust should be powdery. Your fuel should be powdery. It should be dark brown if not black but it shouldn't be striated chunks a lot of times when you see striated chunks you're uh, it's usually a pretty hardwood like something from an oak or a walnut I especially see it when people attempt it on walnuts uh, doing walnut techniques like with bow drill or something like that um, but getting the right hardness like we discussed before uh, of the wood um, you're gonna get the correct looking fuel um, so here's a bit of video to kind of show you uh, in close-up detail the fuel coming from the friction and it's turning into a fertilized egg, a coal ember. And all the dust that it still has is placenta until finally it's transferred to uh, the tinder bundle, which is kind of like a uterus where it's born. Okay, so watch this. So the next variable we'll discuss is the containment or the notch, which is extremely important because where 
the conception of life is going to take place. It has to be in one focus, precise point. So there has to be a place for all that dust to gather. Um, because in our part of the fire triangle, uh, that one place needs to have an extreme critical igniting temperature. Okay, There has to be fuel, there has to be food, and there has to be air. Remember those three parts of the triangle. Air, food, air, fuel, and temperature. And that's going to get us a fire. So all that has to happen in this area of the notch. And earlier we went over um, three different kinds of notches. We had the classic wedge, like triangular shape. We had the box notch, which is a rectangular shape. And then you have my favorite, which is the trapezoid, which is kind of between the two, which is a uh, flattened and triangle. And remember, none of the notches, at least in the drill techniques, they go completely to the center of the diameter of the um, circle. So, uh, your containment, again, like I said, is one of the most underestimated tools we have. Uh, your creation of this, your carving of this, your placement of this is going to be extremely extremely important okay it's going to allow for those three things temperature fuel and air all three to combine in one place in order for conception to happen in order for that cold dust to ignite oxidize and become a coal ember okay uh, some uh, primitive technologists or some people will try to attempt what's called the notchless uh, friction fire. And um, it uh, happens occasionally. Um, a friend of mine from New York, we did a Tamden uh, hand drill. So two people, me and him, we were both on this hand drill. So I went down the stock and then he would go down and then I would go down and we didn't have a notch and we just kept going and going and going until we just uh, totally ran out of energy. And uh, what we did was we used a mullein stalk, which is a uh, plant stalk found in a field. And uh, we did get the inner pith, the inside of that mullein, to be able to uh, ignite. So we were blowing on the end of the spindle, which was uh, a coal in itself. But you have to understand that is uh, most of the time, really not an acceptable way to be able to expect to get a friction fire. Um, you shouldn't really have to count on that. It can happen with things like uh, cattails. If you go long enough, they're soft enough and you can apply enough pressure. But a good portion of the time, it's really not the way to go. Sometimes if you don't have a notch, the dust has, has to go somewhere. So it forms actually a ring around the diameter of where it's burning. And sometimes um, a baby coal ember will form in that ring somewhere in the notchless hand drill or whatever method it is that you're doing. But you really shouldn't uh, count on that. And uh, I don't teach that. I don't say, well, you know, maybe you could do it with a notchless method. But um, you're pretty much never going to hear me say that. Because if lives are on the line, you're not going to do it out of, uh, I think it's kind of more ego is what it really is. I mean, it can happen, it does happen, but when you are trying to really get a fire, you have to have a notch for those three things of the fire triangle to be able to work as efficiently as possible. Um, I think the rest is just uh, playing, and uh, I mean, I would want to definitely try it, just uh, as training, but I would never count on it in a uh, time of extreme need, like we said in our first variable. So you wouldn't put lives on the line based on, on just that. You would use your tools, you would have whatever it is that you have available to create the best effect that you possibly can in order to get that coal ember and get that fire. So you don't want to do that. But there are many different kinds of notches. Right now we're doing a, a spindle notch, but 
we're going to show some other notches with the linear method. Um, we're going to do the fire plow, fire, thawing and fire saw later, and they all have different kinds of notches. But they all follow the same principle. It's a place where all three congregate in order for uh, a coal ember to form and uh, conceive a life. So uh, better to increase the odds with a notch than not at all. Okay? On to the next. So our next variable is the axis um, in keeping a straight line. Now, in later in the other methods, in the linear methods, we're going to talk about having a straight stroke. But in this case, we need to keep the axis straight. And you need to do this for a number of reasons. Well, this uh, variable is actually kind of in two parts. One is, it's the material itself. The material itself needs to be in a straight axis. So it needs to be very straight. The other thing too is, is your skill ability. Your ability that when you're spinning this is that you're keeping it in a straight line and not being all over the place. And we want to do this for a number of reasons. Uh, now the first thing, the fact that this needs to be straight is that the tighter the axis, the straighter this line, the more efficient you're going to be able to transfer your energy down to this one point. Now, if any point of this is off or it's slightly curved or it's a little wobbly, that's going to be a very inefficient transfer of that energy to that one point. Plus, it's going to throw off your method. It's going to throw off your form. Okay? Now, you see that all by itself, it's fairly straight. But now the skill aspect comes in, and keeping a straight line is going to focus all the pressure and all the speed and all the rotations in one place. Okay. Now, one of the uh, troubleshooting problems that you might run into is that one hand stays still and the other hand does all the turning. Well, that throws the axis off, you see. See, my left hand is staying still and my right hand is doing the spinning. But it has to actually be that both hands turn on exactly the same point all the time, which is why you have to have enough space to be free. Otherwise, you end up doing something like that, and you don't want to do that. And why don't you want to do that? Well, when you look at it this way, uh, each time the spindle goes off like this, that's a cooling spot. It cools right there because it doesn't have contact and there's less friction. So it's not reaching critical temperature right there on that side. Well, when it rocks to this side, that side cools down. But each time you rock this back and forth like this, you have cool spot, cool spot, cool spot, cool spot. So it's not maintaining its temperature for one thing. Uh, another problem too is when it's not maintaining its axis, it's actually rubbing up along the side walls, which is creating friction on the side. It's not keeping friction on the bottom. Now there's friction on the side, so now you're fighting friction slowing you down instead of you transferring that energy straight to the bottom of the, the spindle, meaning the base. So you don't want to do that either. Okay. Uh, another thing is uh, by you not maintaining a straight line, you're never going to acquire enough rotation. You're never going to acquire enough speed, which are other variables that we're going to go into. And therefore, you're not going to get to critical temperature. Okay. So there's a lot of reasons why this needs to be right in a straight line. You gotta maintain your axis. And this will be called a uh, linear stroke later when we get into other methods. But each time we go into a different method, we're gonna review all these variables to see how they change, okay? So another important aspect of maintaining your axis is uh, if it's not 
straight up and down, it's going to cause uh, what we call a drift. And what happens is, for example, if I lean back a little bit uh, and I'm heading toward the notch, I'm going to start burning into the notch, into the wedge of the notch. And we saw what happened before uh, when I was using this solid bamboo chopstick. It drifted because my axis wasn't good for one thing um, in the spinning and it tilted back a little bit and started drifting into the notch causing that nippling effect. And you don't want that because it totally destroyed my efforts. Um, so anytime you change your angle, your hole is actually where it's mated, is actually going to move over. And uh, it almost seems to defy the laws of physics, but your hole will move if you start burning in that direction. So if I tilt it this way, my hole is actually going to move in that direction. And same thing this way. And I definitely don't want to burn toward the notch. Okay, I want to keep where it's mated exactly in that place, so I need to drill straight down on that axis and maintain that. So your form has to be just like that. Okay. Okay, the next variable is surface area. And in a way we went over this earlier when we talked about the bamboo, how the uh, bamboo chopstick that we talked about earlier is actually solid, has a solid end, and we made a point on that in order to get that started in the base. But then we had to carve out a hole for a diameter on the hollow bamboo, which has no center. And, uh, but this is also uh, not just a difference of material, it's a difference of you being able to get a fire. Um, surface area, uh, at least on the hollows, okay, they will always focus the friction better. Now, where you essentially want the friction to be is actually on the outside of the ring to begin with because um, that's where all the pressure is going to be. Uh, that's where all the friction is going to be. And uh, what happens is with the center, at least in the solids, the center spins slower than the outside. So here's what you'll always see when you're doing a solid. It will always round off because the center isn't burning as much as the outside. So when this is pointed and then you've mated your base and your spindle together, okay, what you would want to do then once this is mated is like I said before, is you want to cut this flat and uh, get the surface area flat. And what will happen is, is that you work your way down, what you'll notice is it starts to round off again. Because what's happening is the center is burning slower than the outside, and the outside is burning faster than the center, so it creates a perfect half dome on the bottom. But what this does is it actually defeats your, your efforts and your purpose. So uh, just by that scientific fact alone, just by having a ring instead of a solid, increases your chances because everything is just focused on the outer ring to begin with and then you don't have to mess around with the center so there's two things you can do when you have a solid piece one is to just keep flattening it so you take your sandpaper or your braiding stone or your saw or your knife and you just cut it flat or braid it flat the other thing you would want to do with this is actually take your knife or take your drills and you're going to carefully so you don't hurt yourself is carve out the center a little bit and make it hollow. What this will also do is allow you to save on that other variable of energy because you're not trying to work a center which isn't going anywhere. All your energy is now focused on the outer ring as it should be and it will always increase your chances if you get rid of the center. So the less surface area you're working with, the better. But that's not always the case. You have to know what the mean is, what the balance is. You have to know what is enough surface area, what's too little, what is too much, 
and how you do that is through training. So that's what makes all the plant stalks great spindles, is that most of them are hollow and pithy. The thistles, the dogbane, the uh, amaranths, the lettuce, the teasels, the mullins, all of them are hollow if, and some of them just have pits, which are pretty much uh, just a sponge and is not a solid center, but uh, that's what makes these things as great hand drills because you have the energy to be able to spin a spindle like this into a cult because it doesn't have a greater amount of surface area which uses up too much energy for you to be able to not get a cult. Your chances are always increased with the hollow. Now when we get into linear methods, again we're going to talk about surface area because there can be too much and there can be too little, especially when you're working with the fire plow, the fire saw, and the fire thaw. Okay, they're very important. So uh, there is a uh, kind of a myth out floating around there too that uh, the hollow part is actually like a heat chamber. It actually uh, insulates more heat. It holds more temperature, which allows for ignition. But I think it just mainly uh, focuses the friction better into the areas that it's supposed to be at for ignition. So I think that's really a better theory than the uh, heat chamber one. So uh, remember, more surface area is going to require more pressure, more energy. So to lessen that increases your chances. Um, all right, on to the next. Now, uh, this is a very important variable, uh, and it's called space. And uh, this is one that I especially learned in my martial arts training, um, where you have to have enough room to be able to do what it is, uh, whatever technique it is that you're going to be able to perform. And uh, actually, uh, from a yin-yang kind of point of view, um, you don't always want to look at the solid or the form. Sometimes you want to lurk at all the space in between or around what it is that you're trying to accomplish. So it's kind of like um, looking at a tree. Um, one of the ways you can identify a tree is looking at its shape. And uh, but in order to do that, you have to have the skyline behind it in order to see what shape it is. So space is just as important as the form itself. So, but in this instance, um, remember the thing I said before about using uh, where one hand stays still and the other hand moves? Well, a lot of times that's because uh, somebody's arm is locked up on one side and doesn't have any room. So what happens is, is this arm stays here and this one has enough room to move for whatever reason and this goes back and forth. Well, that's kind of pretty bad form, for one thing, but that can be easily fixed by having space on both sides and being able to kind of just fly through space and just work that way. Um, so when we get into other methods, there's going to be like string or cordage placement, like for example, on your bow drill, you have to have enough room for it to be able to move up and down. Um, another thing about space, especially with the hand drill, is the um, length of the spindle itself, okay? Because if I have a shorter hand drill, I've limited my space in a sense, especially if I'm in a sitting position or a kneeling position or kind of like a, a crouched position, okay? I've limited my space because I need to be around this thing and have my body weight on top of it. So this is why a lot of times in, uh, in practice, I'm always working on a table. But um, when I'm kind of getting serious about my practicing and I'm in proper form, uh, I have to do it in my actual sitting or kneeling or um, standing position if my spindle is long enough. But for training purposes, sometimes I'll have a spindle, like I said before, it's like maybe three inches long. And I only have that much space to work with to be able to spin down. So, 
Um, another thing about space is uh, you have to, wherever it is you're doing your, your method, if you're going to actually ignite a fire, that, you know, your TP fire isn't like all the way down over there. So you should be kind of near your TP fire. The ground is clear of any kind of obstacles uh, that would be in your way. Um, everything should just be kind of giving you enough room to be able to perform whatever it is, the method that you're doing. And again, we'll go over this with other methods so you can see the problems you can run into. Uh, like I was mentioned earlier, when you're doing uh, the kneeling form, you have to be able to open up your hips. Well, that gives you space because if your hips were like this, or if your knee was like this, I couldn't move this one side. So you have to kind of open up this hip, give yourself space to be able to perform the technique if you're holding the base with your foot or something like that. So having enough room, having enough space to be able to perform whatever it is that you're going to do uh, is a key variable in itself too. All right, so on to the next. Okay, so pressure. Very important variable here. Um, in the hand drill, in the case of the hand drill method, you are the pressure. Okay, uh, this is, again, the less pieces you have, the more energy is required. And uh, one of those important energies you need to transfer down here is pressure. Because pressure is what creates the friction. So if there's no pressure, there's not going to be any friction. Okay. Um, and those two aspects of the fire triangle, temperature and fuel, uh, are not going to come about if there's no pressure. Now, friction comes from pressure, but there's two kinds of frictions that is going on, okay? Now, the friction that we always think of is the um, heat that comes from friction, that we think that we're just raising the temperature, but we're actually doing two things at once. There's a friction that causes abrasion, uh, and you have to kind of think of it as uh, like grinding in a, a, a grain wheel, if you've ever seen that, a primitive grain wheel, where they throw grain in between two stones and the wheel grinds all that down into a fine powder. Well, the pressure of the wood on wood here not only increases the temperature, but takes pieces of wood off, very fine pieces, and ignites them as it runs under the wood going back on itself. So we'll go over that again later. But um, you're not going to be able to get fuel because it won't make powder if you don't have enough pressure, and it won't ignite to the temperature, that critical igniting temperature that you're looking for to make fire in that fire triangle if you don't have enough pressure. So this is why your form in your method of the hand drill has to be really key. And again, this is the, out of all the methods, I think is the really the, the most basic and the key one to learn. So uh, you're gonna see as we go over other methods that you're able to better increase your chances of putting down more pressure with less energy expenditure. And uh, when we finally get to the toggle drill, you're gonna be amazed by the things that we're gonna be able to uh, pull off. Things that I used to think that were impossible actually turn out to be uh, the easiest things I've ever seen. So uh, again, I'll be going over that. Less pieces, uh, more energy, and vice versa. Uh, more pieces, less energy kind of thing as we go up the scale with methods. So pressure, at least in the hand drill, you are the pressure. So maintaining your axis, getting right alongside the spindle, okay? And you are the, you are the pressure. So uh, what I'm going to do is again, is show you that video 
and this time I want you to pay particular attention to the focus of pressure as it increases temperature and creates fuel because those are the two frictions that is going on with pressure okay abrading friction and temperature friction okay watch this again So our next variable is temperature. Now, as you're starting to notice, all of these variables all intermingle and are interrelated with each other. So basically, they're all inseparable in order to get a friction fire method going. So uh, again, in that fire triangle, uh, one of the most important aspects is being able to raise that temperature. Okay, to get to that critical igniting temperature. Um, I read a article in, uh, it's a website under what's called Primitive Ways. And a guy actually did a, because he's an engineer, he did um, some testing with a soldering iron about at what temperature different dusts would ignite at. It was a very interesting article. Uh, I think he wrote it in the Bulletin of Primitive Technology but his article is also posted on the website. And very interesting article. But there's um, obviously different uh, coal dusts will ignite at different temperatures depending on what they are. Like he did one with uh, a wood coal mule fat and a couple other ones and they all ignited what seemed to be at different temperatures. So um, again, hardness is going to be a key factor in trying to achieve that temperature um, and how much energy you're going to need to expend in order to apply pressure. You can see that they're all intermingling uh, together. So uh, but there's different theories on what temperature it is that you need, but I think that th the key is, is that at different hardnesses, at different speeds, different rotations, you're going to get different temp critical temperature ignitions. So I think they could probably be as low as around 600. Uh, as well as the, uh, the number that's always bounced around, which is like seven or 800 degrees to achieve that critical temperature. But in his study, it was actually lower than that. So, which is very interesting to note. And uh, it was good information to uh, have on hand of that experiment. So, um, all right, on to the next. All right, our next variable is um, back and forth, also known as uh, reciprocation. So 
Um, in a lot of experiments, some people will try to take a piece of wood of, of a spindle, put it on an electric drill, which obviously only goes in one direction, spinning, and uh, try to get a fire started that way. But um, it just doesn't work. So why is that? Well, remember we talked about um, the two frictions. There's the one that ignites temperature, reaches that critical temperature, that creates heat. But then there's the other one that's abrasive. Well, I think what is going on is um, as the spindle spins in one direction, it shaves off those little pieces, it abrades those little pieces off, but when it goes back on itself, it tumbles those little pieces back underneath, uh, under the wood friction. As it goes back and forth, it tumbles inside underneath all that pressure, and that's where the powder actually ignites. Because if you were to just go in one direction, then again you have that grain mill effect where the stone just throws out the powder of like uh, if you're grinding wheat, it would be flour that comes out. And you notice uh, if you ever look at a grinding stone, how the powder just comes off on the sides. It's just splayed out in a spiral. Well, I think it doesn't get a chance to ignite because it just gets thrown out. But the fact that it goes back again and tumbles under itself is what allows it to oxidize and uh, achieve that critical temperature for those small little pieces of powder to ignite. And then it finally, as it goes out, enters the pile of coal dust. And in there, it has enough temperature, enough air, and enough fuel to be able to conceive a life, like a fertilized egg. So this reciprocation, this back and forth motion is actually extremely important as an aspect, but uh, I think it's very key that the dust tumbles back on itself inside where the friction is, where the two frictions are. So, Right, on to the next. Another critical variable, and actually it's one of them that's part of the fire triangle, is air or oxygen. Now, um, when we were talking about the TP fire uh, and uh, the hearth and all that stuff, um, I mentioned things about like windbreaks, about econo uh, being economical with your fuel because when wind gets in your fuel, your fire, it burns your fuel faster, okay? But in this instance, the air is uh, necessary in order for ignition here, and there needs to be a good balance of that. Now, too much air, and uh, a lot of this is key with the notch, the notch size. This is why the size has to be really important. If your notch is too big, uh, then what happens is there's not enough surface area in the base and there's too much space so it never reaches temperature and it has too much air and too much air means that it's actually cooling so your notch needs to be the right size because if it's your notch is too small then your notch gets really um, impacted with the fuel with the coal dust you're trying to create, and there's no air inside the notch to allow for ignition. So there has, you have to strike a balance with the notch for air to get inside. So as you're doing your friction and your notch is filling with dust, okay, um, air has to be able to get inside. Now, you don't want a stiff breeze blowing into the notch either, which would be cooling um, it just needs to have enough air to be able to achieve critical temperature, which is extremely important. So, because it is part of that fire triangle, and that makes it essential. Okay, so just you want to keep that in mind as well. Another key variable that goes hand in hand 
with the back and forth reciprocation variable is rotations. Or in the linear case, it's strokes. But in the axis case, it's uh, rotations. So uh, we had talked about earlier where you don't want to do short ones like this because um, it seems really fast, but it's not getting the necessary friction, uh, both abrading friction and temperature friction if you don't have enough rotation. So you have to maximize your hand surface area in order to get the maximum amount of strokes if you're doing a hand draw, okay? So if you have your hands in the middle like this, you're gonna get pretty short strokes. So you have to start with your fingertips to your palm and go all the way to the other side in order to get this to turn as many times as possible. Now with different methods, it's gonna be your bowstring or with the pump drill, you'll see it's gonna be with two cords that wrap around. Then you're gonna have your toggle drill, which is gonna be wrapped around multiple times. But you'll see that um, you'll be able to maximize on all of these variables as we go up in methods. But again, we have to get this handle down. So getting the most amount of rotations in this case is going to be using all of the surface areas of your hand as you, can, as you possibly can to get to spin as many times as you can, okay? Um, in the longest amount of time, which we're gonna go over next. So you have to keep going with as many rotations until finally this is filled with dust, it has reached critical temperature, and has ignited, okay? So, and uh, short rotations like this is not gonna cut it. It's just not gonna do the job, okay? As you'll see. All right, on to the next. Also in regards to uh, rotations, um, I had mentioned before earlier that you'll also want to be uh, getting uh, dowels of different sizes from your hardware store just so you can uh, have an idea of measurements as to uh, as a reference so one of the things I have here is a 1 and 1 8 diameter and it doesn't matter what kind of wood it is either it's a hardwood or some kind of but it really doesn't matter, you use it as a reference. This is one inch by four feet, seven eighths of an inch. And then we go down to three quarters, five eighths, and one half inch. And then of course you need, are going to need to find uh, other diameters too, especially for your hand drill. You know, your three eighths, you know, and things like that, like the ones we mentioned before, and make sure you have that gauge. So you have references to different rotations. Rotations are different, are important in the sense that uh, uh, when you're working with different diameters, such as this one half inch, okay, compared to my uh, three eighths inch bamboo, the diameters are different, okay, which means that if I were to spin the half inch diameter one, okay, I'm not going to get as many rotations because the diameter is thicker, if you understand. So one of the things you want to do to increase rotation is to make sure that your spindle is at the thinnest diameter possible in order to get the maximum amount of rotations and therefore more speed. So that's a key issue. So uh, one of the things that we used to see all the time uh, when I was teaching the friction fire methods uh, at the school was that people would, um, when they're working on their bow drills, for example, they would make them really, really thick, just like this. You know, sometimes they were like an inch and a half, sometimes two inches, you know, in diameter for their bow drills. But you know what? When you're working with a bow drill, sometimes you only even need a, a half inch. And also, you have to also think when you have to collect material out in the wilderness, uh, it'll probably be more to your advantage 
uh, to also find smaller diameter material, you're going to get more rotations, more spin, and therefore a better chance of getting your fire together if your diameter is thinner, on the thinner side. So you have to keep that in mind with rotations. The size of the diameter is going to determine the amount of rotations you'll be able to do. And when you're talking about hand drill, that's very key because uh, obviously this is all you got to be able to spin this spindle. Okay, so as many times as you can get this thing to go around, the better. So, all right, just keep that in mind regarding rotations, diameter, size, okay, and have references just to work with. Okay, so the next important variable, because they're all important, is duration or time. In the uh, length of time, that you're able to perform the method to achieve that uh, critical ignition. So, uh, you know, there's people that will always say, well, you know, I could do my hand drill in, I don't know, 20 seconds, or I could do a bow drill in uh, 10 seconds. But, you know, none of that matters. Really, none of it. You just throw all that stuff out the window. When people say that, it's, it's just ego. What's really important is to just get the coal ember, no matter how long it takes and no matter how many tries it takes. Because the, the point is not competition. Because uh, all that's ego. That is not the purpose and function of learning friction fire. The purpose of learning friction fire is to save lives and to get a fire because uh, it's necessary for supporting life. So throw all that other stuff out the window. That doesn't mean anything, okay? Um, what is important is your, um, your energy level okay, and your health, because you need to be able to, especially with the hand drill, go for as long as you need to go to be able to um, acquire that, that ignited coal. So, and the thing is too is, uh, you want to be able to go as long as you can the first time uh, to at least get that coal, because uh, you don't really want to do it a second time or a third time or a fourth time. I mean, if you have to, you're going to because uh, it's life supporting. But better to go nice and easy for one long time and get the coal that you need the first time out, not for ego, but because it's uh, the more economical and more sustainable way to go than to have to kind of keep doing it multiple times. So make sure all your pieces are cut the way they're supposed to be, that everything is in place, and that you're finally settled in, ready to go, and like, okay, you just need to do your rotations, um, maintain your speed, maintain your pressure, and balance all your variables and just get it going. But that just has to happen over a period of time. So in your period of time that you're doing this, um, it's broken down kind of into uh, different areas of time. So your first time is your warm up. Now you're not necessarily adding a whole lot of pressure. Now I can see that there's little bits of dust starting to form. I'm not giving it a whole lot of pressure, but I want to give the woods a chance to heat up. And again, it's that concept that I talked about before about um, getting your water to boil, okay? Your water has to achieve a temperature of the uh, boiling point before it can actually get to a rolling boil. So let's say it's sort of achieved that temperature now. So now I'm going to add a little bit more pressure. I'm doing as much rotation as I can, which allows for a lot of speed at the same time. I'm maintaining my axis as best I can. I have a lot of space. So I'm able to fly through space and Um, after you warm up and you start to uh, create pressure, I did actually two things. I uh, filled the notch with dust and I started to get it to a critical igniting temperature. Which you can see the coal down there now. Alright. But you have to be able to go long enough 
to be able to get it to that point. Okay. But again, all of your pieces, all of your variables need to be in place for you to last to be able to achieve that as well. Okay. Okay, we're in the home stretch. So uh, the next variable is speed. So obviously from an exaggerated point of view, I'm getting enough rotation Okay, my axis is straight. Let's say I even have enough pressure, but you could feel instinctually that that's really not fast enough to help with the temperature ignition friction, right? So with the rotations you're doing, the rotations that you're trying to accomplish with the back and forth reciprocation, it has to be at a speed in order to start getting it to an igniting temperature. Now there's, it's already warmed up and we have dust and temperature, dust and temperature, dust and temperature, dust and temperature going into the notch. Our axis is straight, okay? And we have another coal. So as you can see, uh, you have to have the right amount of speed as well to get to that critical temperature and uh, get those two frictions, abrading friction as well as uh, temperature friction. Okay, and our last variable is stability. And this is a really key important one. They're all key and important. But uh, uh, we're going to start with the base. Now, uh, your material as well has to be stable and strong enough and able enough to be able to uh, structurally fulfill its function and its purpose. Now, as you can see with these, this handrail base of cedar, now the grain is running this way. So what happens is we have all these holes with these notches, and as you can see what happens is here, where all the notches are lined up, it's very weak, because it's against the grain. And uh, as you can see, if you're not careful, they, uh, they, they just break and pop off. So uh, you can uh, remedy this by creating more space between the holes and the notches, for one thing, uh, another point of stability is your base can't be allowed to move because you'll be doing your technique and your base is moving all around and that's just destroying all your efforts because your notch is the place where everything is supposed to be concentrated and focused while you're losing fuel, uh, the air balance isn't right, uh, you're not achieving, achieving good temperature because now your axis is off because you're all over the place, your base has to always be stable. However it is that you have to do that. Now, um, primitively, if I'm not kneeling or stepping on this board in one manner, I'm going to take sticks or stakes, and I'm going to pin the base to the ground in one form or another. So that way it doesn't move. So uh, that's one way to do that. But uh, most of the time, you're going to be practicing your technique and your method and you're going to be doing this in a sitting kneeling kind of position where the base is, is going to be stable and supported um, braced against you in some way Now the other thing too is is if your spindle isn't straight or if your board uh, is crooked or wobbly or has a uh, uh, airplane wing um, curve into it, it's not going to sit flat and stable, okay? Even if you have it braced under your foot, it may still move because, um, because of its shape. So uh, you have to have all these factors in mind. Now if the spindle isn't straight, sometimes that can cause a vibration and uh, 
the vibration alone with this being off is enough to destroy your efforts in the notch and uh, not allow that cold to be able to form. Another thing could be, uh, when we get into other methods, is uh, you might have your tinder bundles sitting under your base to catch uh, your coal, so that's automatically there. You would lift up your base, and your coal is sitting right there in the tinder bundle for you to blow into flame. But what can happen is fibers from the tinder bundle actually fold over and get into your, not only your notch, but inside where it's mated, and starts to destroy everything. So that would destroy the stability of what it is that you're trying to do as well. Um, and the other thing too is, is uh, your carvings have to all be precise. And your spindles have to uh, uh, all be not only straight, but completely cylindrical. Okay, because uh, for example, your side walls here when it, goes, when it gets mated, the spindle actually sinks down into the base a little bit, right? So these walls here has to be an excellent cylinder, okay? It can't have rough edges or you have sidewall friction that not only slows you down, but creates a horrible vibration in the base, catches the base, wants to spin the base around. Okay, so you have to kind of keep that in mind. Anything that's going to um, destroy the stability of what it is that you're trying to do. Um, when you're doing your hand drill method, okay, you have to be careful that you don't accidentally pop this up. So you're doing your method. In order to keep stability, you get to the bottom, hold this in place, put your other hand back at the top, shoot this one up, and work your way down again. Okay, and then you start all over again. Okay to maintain your stability so that you don't do something like pop that out by accident or go off or in worst case scenario you bend this out and you actually bust this whole thing wide open. You've actually spread it apart, viced it apart, uh, wedged it apart. So don't defeat your own efforts with your uh, with bad form. Keep practicing your form. Okay? And uh, Hour. Oh, so, and your drift. If you have drift, you might enter into the notch. You're going to create that nippling effect if you have a solid center. Not a hollow center, but a solid center. And it'll start creating that nippling effect as it drills into the notch and will destroy the hole. Uh, it will destroy the temperature. It'll break up your fuel. And then the air won't matter because it's already cool. Okay. So, all of your variables. Balanced together get you a uh, friction bar. All right. So now we're going to go on to um, hand drill part two. Uh, we're going to talk about um, natural materials and uh, boards and other things. Now that you've seen the basic form, we're going to get more heavy into uh, the hand drill and the things that you can. They can't do and play around with. All right, here we go.